Hey everyone, the name is Chris Parachi. Welcome to Comment Time number 12. Oh, fail. I've received tons of really cool questions and just overall comments. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, I've picked out a couple of them to discuss in this video. Before we start, a short reminder, if you enjoy my videos, please hit subscribe and ring the bell and check out the description box under the video for additional infos, timestamps, gear links, etc. All the fun stuff. Let's start with a comment from John Carpenter. He wrote this under my video about my self-customized um, Les Paul Jr., my Les Paul CM. John writes, Thanks so much for this video. Love the guitar and how you personalized it. Sounds absolutely amazing through the double trouble. Uh, that's the Honey BM's double trouble overdrive pedal. One question I had about fitting the P90 in the humbucker route. How much work did it take to make it fit? Did you just do a little trimming with a Dremel or a router? Fill in with a wood block and reroute? Also, have you played Jerry James Nichols' Epiphone Old Glory? How do you think the guitars compare? Let's start with the last question. I had a chance to play one or two Old Glories when they came out, which was quite a while ago, and I never had the chance to like directly compare my junior to one of those. So um, I don't think it makes any sense to talk about sound differences or anything. They feel different though, because the Old Glory has a normal Les Paul thickness. It's basically like a Les Paul Custom, but with one P90 and a wraparound bridge. So uh, my guitar is way thinner, way lighter too. And fitting the P90 in the humbucker routing was a, a Dremel kind of job. I didn't panic too much about it looking pretty or not because I knew the, uh, the dog ear cover will cover up everything and I knew this is just gonna be a, a, my fun project. The width was a little different and uh, P90 is a little longer, so I needed to take care of that. <laughs> This next comment is also about my customized junior. It's from Ivan Romanenko. Hello Chris, thanks for the video. Could you please share the schematics of this guitar's volume and wiring in the next Q&A episode? Sure, no problem. There you go, bam. <laughs> it's a pretty simple wiring and that's exactly what I love about it. It's just the pickup going to the volume pod and the volume pod and the tone pod is connected with this 50s wiring. It's a pretty simple thing and it's uh, just one capacitor, that's it. Razark wrote this under my five things you need to know about amps. Hey Chris, I have a question regarding preamp tubes. If you're using an overdrive or distortion pedal into a preamp, how important are the tubes? Isn't that pedal undoing the effect of the tubes in the overall sound versus using the actual gain from the preamp to overdrive? I'm just curious how much the tubeness comes into play if you have what is essentially a solid state circuit amplifying and clipping the sound before it. Sorry if this is a really stupid question and thanks for the videos. Sorry for the interruption. This is editor Chris with the glasses and everything. Um, I just realized that this answer I gave to this question was way too long <laughs> and I didn't even talk about the most important thing. So um, let's sum it up. Let's keep it short. A tube amp is uh, a closed system, right? So you have an input, you plug your guitar in, then you have your preamp to shape your tone, then the power amp to make it loud, and all you need after that is a passive speaker, your guitar cab, right? So an amplifier was designed to do all the work. <laughs> you don't need anything else to make it sound tubey or transistory or whatever the amp is. Let's say it's a tube amp. 
right? It has tubes in the preamp, tubes in the power amp. They have their own function. They do different things, of course, and, uh, and it will sound a certain way. If you put an overdrive in front of that, which in many cases are transistor-based designs, you will not take away of the amp's tubiness at all. It's, it's more like this overdrive will benefit from all the harmonics and the compression, whatever is happening in a tube amp, right? It was designed to work with a tube amp. So if you have a good distortion or overdrive pedal and you set it up a certain way and play it, the listener has no chance of telling if he's listening to uh, an overdrive pedal, a transistor overdrive, in front of a tube amp, or if he's listening to a tube amp creating that overdrive or distortion. I actually experienced the opposite of what you told. Most tube-driven pedals, overdrives, distortions, they go in a tube amp's preamp, like through the whole tube amplifier. It can just be too much too much tubiness, too much warmth and thickness and whatever, it sort of becomes overwhelming sometimes. Of course, there are exceptions. There are tube-based um, overdrives or whatever that work perfectly into an amp's input, like through the preamp and the power amp. But most of these tube-driven pedals will sound best if you plug them in the FX return, which is going th straight to the power amp. I do not have the feeling that transistor uh, design overdrives and distortions will sound less tuby at the end if you plug that into a, a tube amp. Actually, you cannot even tell the difference. You cannot hear the transistors or the amount of tubes in a sound. The question is if they match, if they work well together, it's as good as an amplifier distorting. It's of course not always the case. Next one is from SCH2412. Why does everyone dislike small frets? I haven't played anything smaller than medium jumbo, but I'd like to try it. He or she is talking about my customized junior where the original frets were pretty wide, like sort of medium jumbo wide, but very low. And um, I didn't even realize this for a couple of weeks or months of owning it. It was just something about the guitar I couldn't really explain. So the whole experience is way more like a fretless instrument. It's not the same, of course, but you get a little closer to that feeling and you would not bend on a fretless, right? <laughs> it's just not a thing. And as soon as you try to bend on really low frets, it's going to be that sticky feel. And um, I just didn't like it that much. So, uh, so I refretted the guitar. And I'm not saying that low frets or vintage frets are not good at all. It's complex, but I think that's mainly the reason why most people just don't like to play very low frets because they have to relearn everything they learn about playing the guitar. <laughs> This is from Watcher Zero. Man, people cannot just leave stuff alone. <laughs> Those guitars are fine the way they came. Of course, obviously. I just love customizing guitars. And uh, in most cases, I know exactly what I want. And it's really hard to find a guitar that does it all. Like, 
checks all the little boxes of what I want. And um, it's just something that I love doing. It inspires me to customize guitars, to, um, to build guitars, to fix guitars. It's just, I think, one of the coolest things to do in your free time. And um, honestly, I could imagine way worse stuff to spend my time and money on. <laughs> and of course, the guitar in its stock, shape and form was a great guitar. Um, but I clearly upgraded every little spec on it just ever so slightly. Like uh, the frets, the new frets make it more playable. The GeForce tuners, well, okay, there's a big upgrade now. <laughs> <laughs> and man, that Lolar P90 pickup, that dog ear pickup is ridiculous. And the electronics, the original pots were fine, but these make the guitar sing way more. You have more harmonics, more dynamics. You can go back with the volume or the tone and you have all those usable, beautiful sounds. And the bridge, I mean, the original alloy, whichever it was, was all right, of course. But as soon as I changed it to this uh, solid piece of uh, aluminum, or aluminum for the US guys. Uh, it's just such a difference. This next one is not even just one comment, it's more like a comment thread, uh, which was under my The Mac and PC of CapSims, which was about the Captor X, wait, uh, that guy, and the Oxbox, uh, that guy, <laughs> um, which are the two cab and mic simulation boxes that I used to record all the guitar sounds on my channel. Uh, so, first of all, Vapenfagan uh, wrote a comment and he told like he owned uh, the Capture X and the Ox box as well, sold both and now he wants the Ox back because he enjoyed uh, the whole Ox experience a lot more. And then at the end, Max Mustermann wrote and eventually you will end up buying an isolation cab because everything else is just a compromise. The way I see this is, in theory, isolation cabs uh, or boxes are the best. But that's the theory. I have a, a bit of an experience with ISO cabs. Um, there was this first self-built one, which was a oh, huge, it filled up a room basically. It was an ISO cab we built ourselves. Uh, for my old 4x12 cab and a mic in front of it with a, a big mic stand. Um, and we used to have this set up to record our second album with my old metal band Tuzmodar back in, um, in Budapest, Hungary. And um, we were struggling with that setup a lot. And then later on at Toman, we wanted to do a, a video on um, something, uh, impulse responses maybe, um, compared to an ISO cab or whatever. And uh, we had this one ISO cab in another room with a cable, of course, the mic cable. Uh, and um, we just really didn't like the sound we got again. And this was the second time I really wanted an ISO cab to sound fantastic and it disappointed me. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And the only thing I can think of is uh, that most ISO cabs will produce uh, some sort of a boxy sound because both times they sounded like this. It's like, why is that happening? And obviously there's the, the logical first thought. There's no room involved. It's just a tiny little box um, full of absorbers and stuff and uh, just a mic right in front of a cab, um, in front of a speaker, sorry. Um, it's just too sterile. The bigger issue is this weird frequency peak or whatever that comes from um, the waves coming from the speaker hitting the wall just a few centimeters behind uh, like in front of the speaker coming back and then there's the mic in the middle here's the speaker here's the wall of the iso cab and in the middle is a microphone and that microphone of course picks up everything it picks up the direct signal from the speaker itself and picks up the reflection that comes back because obviously there is some reflection, even if the, uh, the ISO cab is full of absorbers and stuff. It, there is some uh, weird reflection happening in that tiny little space. So that made my ISO cab uh, experiences both times not very enjoyable, <laughs> to be honest. And of course, if you 
know exactly what you're doing, you're patient and you have all the um, experience you need to, um, to get a great sound with an isocab, it's perfect, it's awesome. There are many bands who also use isocabs on stages. <laughs> Next one is from Yusef Kasim. Man, your videos are so entertaining. Thanks a lot. You're not the only nerd out there. Don't hesitate to talk more, uh, talk about these nerdy stuff. And about comment six, can you please make a video step-by-step step on recording your guitar sound and all the steps needed to get to the final product? Keep it up, man. I think I sort of explained how I record my guitar in, um, for example, in my studio rundown video I did last year. I will do a new one and I can go more into details, like uh, actually show how I tweak stuff and uh, what I do in the DAW, like in a computer, which few plugins I'm using. That's about the only thing I didn't show in that uh, studio rundown video. But it's basically really simple. I have the guitar going into the pedal board, then the cable going into the input of the amp, then the amp, whichever head it is, the uh, Rev or the Mesa, uh, will go into one of the two load boxes, into the Captrax or into the Aux box, which have cab simulation and microphone simulation built in. Then with a cable, a fitting cable, I'm going into my audience audio interface, and that's basically like a sound card. So from there on, it's just a USB cable going into the computer where I have my uh, digital working, uh, like audio workstation, my DAW, and um, I just push record and then I record my guitar sound. So it's pretty simple. It's all about the tweaking though. Uh, I was uh, tweaking the aux and the Captrex a lot. I don't use a lot of um, plugins. There's just a, a few subtle compression going on, like a multiband. Sometimes I don't even have it on always. Um, I have a very nice Waves mastering tool I started using and that improved uh, the sound of my videos for sure. And um, other than that, very subtle EQs from uh, FabFilter. And I have a FabFilter limiter um, in the master insert section because I obviously don't want my videos to clip. And that's pretty much it. But I can go more into details and actually show what I'm talking about in uh, one of my next videos whenever I'm shooting anything that's related to my studio or my recording setup. <laughs> My most controversial video I put on my channel was the truth about cheap and expensive guitars. If you're interested in the video, just check it out. It's going to be in the description box. Cage80 wrote about the hate thing. Most of the time I've seen the ones buying expensive stuff to be the ones that hate or diss the cheaper ones. I know some players that really think that if you play a Harley Benton, you can't be serious and a good player. But to judge someone by what brand they're using, that's what I don't get. Thanks for the video, by the way. Pretty good insight on the subject. Thanks a lot, Cage. Um, I know exactly what you mean, uh, but I don't think it's only the, um, the expensive gear users who are hating on the other party. I think this whole hate thing is pretty balanced, to be honest. There are the arrogant ones who have all the nice gear and will laugh at people who have just sort of um, inexpensive gear. And then on the other hand, 
there are quite a few people who get really upset as soon as someone says good things about something that's expensive. Like you'll find tons of these uh, hate comments in forums and in comment sections and everything. As soon as someone says a good thing about a custom shop, it's like, oh, come on, you just want to... To be honest, I cannot understand any of these two camps or parties. The snobbery, I think, is just arrogant and stupid. And there are enough incredible players who just don't give a damn about gear that much. They just have a, an okay guitar and they're totally fine with it. And in the other camp, of course, if you can't or don't want to afford expensive guitars, but you have something you really love playing, you sort of feel like those arrogant idiots buying guitars for four or 5,000 euros have no idea how good my guitar is. So I, I understand the, the psychology behind it. Just the hate part is what's really bugging me because it's all subjective. And there's one thing I've learned from all guitar players in the guitar industry or music industry. And doesn't matter if it's a hired gun, a session player, um, cover musician, uh, an actual huge star, a guitar hero, whatever. You will not find one of these guys who are actually su successful in what they're doing who will hate on anything or anyone. And that has a very good reason. Because if you're one of the haters, you will never make it in these circles. No one will want you in their project, in their session, in their band, if you're one of those It's just not cool. It's just not working and no one wants any of this. This one came from Gregory Cogioris and it came under my five things you need to know about amps video. I want you to speak about tube amps for home use. You seem to know very well what you're talking about, so it will be very interesting. Some people use volume pedals, other, others pedal on low levels, others attenuation built in or external. Which is the best practical solution for a good low volume tone? Out of all these, attenuation is definitely the best way. To go and uh, you will get the best sound out of your tube setup at home on low volumes. It's not very easy to find a good attenuator though. That's that's the only issue. You will have to be um, okay with paying quite a significant amount of money to have an attenuator that doesn't suck out the liveliness, the dynamics and the top end of your tone. The best two attenuators you can get for the least amount of money in my opinion, are the uh, Rivera Rock Crusher, which is purely just an attenuator, uh, or the Captor X, the Two Notes Torpedo Captor X, uh, which is a little different. Um, these two will be around 500 euro, maybe 500 something. Um, there's a big, big difference between these two, not in terms of quality of the attenuation, but more the focus of the product. The uh, Rock Crusher is... Um, really simple in terms of features it's an attenuator that's it it's a load box and an attenuator and uh, you have quite a few steps of attenuation um, so it's a very usable one it keeps all the presence and the dynamics of your sound so it's it's a fantastic sounding unit the captor x only gives you three levels well four <laughs> first is full volume Second is, I think, 20 dB lower, which is a significant amount. Then the, the lowest attenuation mode is, uh, I think, a minus 40 dB, which means it's whispering quiet. It's super quiet or complete load. So silent. <laughs> I promised Mike Pinion to answer this question. He asked, how did you learn English so well? 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Thanks for the compliment. Um, I'm not that happy with my English, though. <laughs> Uh, it feels very natural to speak the language, but um, I struggle with grammatics and uh, vocabulary and everything all the time. I used to live in Queens, New York as a kid. I moved there at the age of nine and moved back to Europe at the age of 10. So um, I was uh, going to school, public school 174, PS 174. I loved it. My uncle and his family used to live there and um, they asked my parents if They want to send me there to learn the language, to see the world, whatever. And uh, they told, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, it was a hard decision. I'm just kidding. It was a hard decision. And um, I wasn't very happy about it at that age. Uh, but then I flew over. I loved what was going on. I enjoyed uh, living there a lot and uh, obviously learning the language and everything. And um I couldn't be happier and couldn't be more um, thankful for my parents that they allowed this and made this happen. And of course, my uncle and his family, um, family is great. So um, that was fantastic. And that's where I learned the language. That's why it feels so natural. That's why I don't have to really think about how to put a sentence together. It just all feels natural. My problem is that I've lost most of that knowledge I had as a kid because you learn really fast when you're that young um, and then you forget pretty much everything. <laughs> If you don't use the language on a daily basis, that's pretty much the story. I try to learn from my mistakes and um, yeah, I love languages anyhow. So um, it's a lot of fun and a, a nice project basically. And um, I try to become better at it. This comment came under my guitar store trash talk, comment time number 11. Juao Marcelo. Hi Chris, I have a question for you. I have some difficulty to set my live guitar tone. Since I play with the amp very close, pointing to my legs, I tend to increase the highs and mids to compensate this. But I realize that the sound gets a little harsh and fizzy to the public. Little pubs, no mic, etc. Some time ago, I was looking for something like the D-Flex panel, but it's one more thing to carry. So how did you set your tone? It's to pleasure your ears or to the audience. I'm using a vertical 2x12 cabinet with V30s. Great content, as always. Thanks a lot, Huao. You actually mentioned the solution yourself. Yes, it's one more thing to carry. And yes, the price seems to be a little too high. But uh, believe me, the D-Flex panels are ridiculous. They spread the sound of your amplifier so well. If you never try them, you will not understand the price because you would say like, oh, come on, it's a piece of plastic. Why is it like whatever, two, three hundred, whatever it costs. You have to try it first and you will never want to play a small pub show without it anymore. And it's not just you, it's your audience who will also appreciate not being blown away by the direct sound of your, your speakers and, and your bandmates too, who will all of a sudden hear you. And you will not sound harsh anymore because you will hear yourself wherever you stand and you will, you will be able to set up your sound to a more pleasing sound for everyone. Thanks a lot for watching. If you have any questions or anything you want to share, You know where the comment section is. I'll be right there waiting for you. You guys take it easy. I'll be back in a week. Bye-bye.